Hello and welcome to Holy Impact Ministries Bible Study Night. God bless you. I'm Pastor Scott Delane with HolyImpactMinistries.com and we are now moving into the 13th and 14th chapter of the book of Romans. God bless you in that. Once again, thank you for sharing your time with us here today. You know, the, the 13th and the 14th chapter of Romans is very elusive for so very many Christians. And uh, today we're going to try to uh, put this back in its proper context. And we're going to try to tighten the wheels uh, of the cart, if you will. Uh, before we get moving, uh, I just wanted to uh, reiterate a little bit of what we have already learned from the first uh, 12 chapters of the writings of the Apostle Paul. Uh, many Christians believe that the Apostle Paul taught against God's laws, and that God's laws were all nailed to the cross, and that this is what Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, came to die for, was to nail all of God's laws to the cross. Of course, most Christians who have really actually spent any time reading their Bibles know that this is not the truth, uh, and this leads to all kinds of false teaching, like the once saved, always saved, the dispensational grace uh, theory, uh, replacement theology, and all kinds of other different things. And again, it, it, this is all stems from a, a Christian believing that God's laws have all been nailed to the cross. Well, we know, those of us who have been watching this particular Bible study, moving through the very first chapter of Romans all the way down through, and understanding who Paul was speaking to and who his audience was, and keeping him in the right context, we can understand what the, uh, the Apostle Peter was talking about in 2 Peter 3.16, when he warned us that the writings of Paul were hard to understand, and that the ignorant and the unstable would twist the writings of Paul to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. And he told us to be very careful of lawless people so that we didn't lose our own stability. So there was an actual warning coming from the Apostle Peter concerning the writings of the Apostle Paul. And uh, the Apostle Paul can be very elusive and some of the things that he says because of the audience that he was speaking to and because of some of the battles that he was engaged in concerning uh, groups of different people like the uh, circumcision group and the Pharisees and the scribes and you had uh, the Dionysus that loved uh, to, uh, the, the, to uh, worship the other gods and everybody from astrologers to Greek mythologists to uh, all kinds of people into Plato and Aristotle and, and uh, Socrates and just all kinds of different thinking and, and uh, different gods were on the market. In fact, you couldn't even walk through a marketplace uh, where there would be meat for sale, and, and you wouldn't even know whether that meat that was for sale was used to sacrifice to another god or not. And we're going to get into a little bit of that uh, here today. So Paul's audience was much different than what today's modern-day version of Christianity is. They, these, these were not people that were coming to church as we do, uh, sitting uh, in church on the wrong day of the week, uh, once again, listening to some guy that we hardly know preach out of the back half of the book while programming everybody not to pay attention to the first half of the book. Things were much different, much, much different in the early church. And we kind of get into a little bit of that. But I want to, for those of you who believe, that are new uh, to this study, and believe that Paul was uh, teaching against the laws of God, and that the laws of God are all nailed to the cross, I want to show you a few things that I think you will find very interesting. The first thing I'd like to do is just show you a list of proclamations uh, from the Apostle Paul. So let's go ahead and take a look at that very quickly here. Uh, let me get this squared, squared away. Here we go. Very good. Now here's some things through the book of Romans since this, since we've been down, down into the uh, 13th chapter. Now these are just some of the things he said all through the book of Romans. And I want to read some of these to you. Paul says, For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God in Romans 2.13. He says, but the doers of the law who will be justified. Now, this is a very odd thing for a man who's preaching against the laws of God to say, wouldn't you think? It's not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. How about this? As we move along, Romans 3.31, he says, 
He asks the question, do we then overthrow the law by this faith? And he says, by no means. On the contrary, he says, we uphold the law. Something very peculiar. That's very strange for someone who's teaching that we don't have to pay attention to God's laws. Oh, oh, but pastor, don't you know, I'm not saved by works. But James says very clearly, faith without works is dead. So the body, apart from the spirit, is dead. So faith, apart from works, is dead. See, we have to read our Bible. In this last uh, Seventh-day Sabbath, we talked about candy stick scriptures and how we all like to pick out candy stick scripture and we like to just say, well, this is what this candy stick scripture says, so this is what I believe. This is very dangerous for a Christian to do. We must know the proper context, and we must know how that sentence, how that scripture is being used in the storyline, okay, in the letter, in the epistle, okay? So, so keeping that in mind, let's just go ahead. Here's something else he says in Romans 6, 1. He says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Now, what is sin? Sin, according to the Bible, the, the uh, biblical definition of sin is the transgression of the law. So if you do away with the law, you do away with sin. And if you do away with sin, you don't need grace, do you? And if you don't need grace, then you don't need pastors, priests, bishops, and teachers, and you don't need a church, and you don't need any, and you don't need a gospel, you don't need any of it. So you see the domino effect that happens within today's modern-day churchianity as they continue to teach and preach that God's laws have either all been nailed to the cross or divided up in a pie, and you have to eat some of the pie but not the other parts of the pie. My friends, there is no pie in the Word of God. The Word of God says for Jew and Gentile there will be one law for both Jew and Gentile. And we've touched on that many times. Again, so Paul says, what do we say then? Are we to continue in sin, which is the transgression of the law, that grace may abound? He says, by no means. He says, how? He says, how can we who died to sin still live in it? So if you are a Christian and you have been baptized in both the water and the spirit, and God's laws are written on your heart and in your mind, which is the new covenant, then you need to know and understand that you cannot continue to live in sin, according to the Apostle Paul. Here we, we go on in uh, chapter 7, and what do we find him saying? He says, So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and righteous, and good. Now, that's a far cry from the law is a curse, and the law is bondage. Is it not? I think it's a far cry. I think we can all agree on that much. Let's go ahead and move on to Romans 8, 7. What does he say? He says, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. Why? Why is it hostile to God? Why is the mind hostile to God? He answers in the very next sentence. For it does not submit to God's laws. Indeed, it cannot. Therefore, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So if you believe that God's laws have all been done away with, then you are of a carnal mind and you cannot please God, according to the Apostle Paul, who everyone is trying to say has done away with the laws of God. Our Messiah in, in Matthew 5, 17 tells us very clearly, I did not come to abolish the law, I came to do them. And he says, not the crossing of a T or the dotting of an I will pass away from the law until heaven and earth pass away. So this is where we are uh, in the book of Romans, and we have read these things we understand what what Paul is talking about when he says you're not under the law. Right here it is in uh, Romans 8, 2. What law is Paul talking about? He's talking about this. He says right here, Romans 8, 2. He says, For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law. Is that what it says? Oh, I'm sorry. I missed a few words, didn't I? Let's read it again. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death. You see, Paul preached about many different laws in the book of Romans, my friends. And we need to know and understand how many laws did Paul preach about. Well, here's just seven of them right off the bat. Most of these in the book of uh, Romans. that We have the law of God, the law of sin, the law of sin and death the law of the spirit of life, the law of faith, the law of righteousness, and the law of Christ, which is found in 1 Corinthians. 
So a lot of different laws there that Paul is preaching about, isn't it? And we need to know and we need to understand exactly what it is that Paul was preaching and what he was saying about the laws of God. So if we know this, okay, we can look at Romans 8, 2, and we can see, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. That's what the Messiah came to do away with, okay? Once again, our Messiah said he didn't come to abolish the law or the prophets, and not, he said a crossing of a T and the dotting of an I in Matthew 5, 17 would not, would, would not pass away from the law until heaven and earth pass away. And we're still standing on the earth. Paul says in Romans 3, 31, he asks the question, do we overthrow the law by our faith? He says, absolutely not. He actually answers twice. He says, by no means on the contrary, he says. We uphold the law. Let me ask you this, my friends. What have you been taught? about the laws of God. And so this is where we are in the book of Romans. And this is just a short recap for those of you who may not know and may not understand the writings of the Apostle Paul or how to understand him. Uh, again, the Apostle Peter told us that the writings of Paul were hard to understand. And at times it seems as though Paul is going in one direction, uh, preaching against the laws of God. But then if we really know and understand the proper context, who he was speaking to, uh, and who his audience was, and the battles that he was engaged in, and the times that he was living in, we can surely know and understand how to untangle these things. Now, the next two uh, chapters that we're going to take a look at, they're not very long, they're fairly short, but there's a lot to learn in them. The first one is going to be Romans 13. Now, I cannot tell you how many times uh, that uh, people have approached me, even pastors with more degrees than a thermometer, with years of theology and eschatology and hermeneutics and exegesis and all of these uh, fancy big worded glasses uh, that, that everyone takes. And they would say that, you see, Romans 13 says you must bow the knee to your government. Let's read and see if that's exactly what Paul says or not. We're going to go ahead and take a look at Romans 13, and we're going to just take a look at that first chapter. And I want you to know, as we're reading this first chapter, that this church, first chapter was what the Roman Catholic Church and Hitler together used to do what they did to the Jews during the Holocaust. Okay? This was constantly quoted in the churches. Okay? So let's take a look at exactly what it says. This is a, a historical chapter from the book of Romans. Let's get into it. Here we go. Okay, let me change over to Eastward here so we have that. There we go. Chapter 1, Romans 13, chapter 1. He says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that ex uh, exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. The rulers are not a terror to good conduct. Hear this now. The rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. You have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed, to them taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is, is owed, and honor to whom honor is owed. Okay, now this is a very, uh, a very good chapter. Now, is Paul saying anything wrong here? No, he's not. He's not saying anything wrong. He's not saying anything de derogatory. Yahweh God the Father wants us to obey the thing, the laws of man here on earth while we are here on earth and to do and, and keep the laws and to stay, keep our noses clean and, and not to be a hindrance, not to be someone who's, who's arguing all the time. But if it does not conflict with the word of God, then we are to do them. And that's what he's saying here. If they put taxes on you, what did, what did Yeshua say? He said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's when they asked him whether or not they should pay taxes. 
And this is exactly some of what Paul is saying. So we need to know and we need to understand these things and be very, very careful about how we are reading through these things. Now, I've made some bullet points here uh, and some things that I kind of want to go through. Let's take a look at uh, some scripture here very quickly. Uh, concerning bowing the knee to the government that you are under. Okay, let's take a look here. We're going to go to, uh, I believe the first one that I have is Acts uh, 5, 26 and 29. I'm going to go ahead and just some of these that I have selected, I'm going to cross off as we go along so I can keep where I'm at here. 526, it says, The captain with the officers went and brought them, talking about the apostles, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people, because this is where the apostles were caught preaching the gospel of Yeshua HaMashiach. And the authorities and the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees uh, and those in authority didn't like it, and the government didn't like it because it was causing a division, and it was actually taking away the power of these, these high priests and these, these men who were supposed to be scribes and Pharisees. So they didn't like these guys coming along and preaching this new gospel of Yeshua HaMashiach, where Yeshua says, you know, uh, very clearly, he says, Call no man rabbi, for you have one uh, teacher, and you are all brothers. And call no man on earth your father, for you have one father who is in heaven. And call no man your instructor, for you have one instructor, the Christ. So they didn't like them uh, preaching what Yeshua said and, and a lot of his gospel. So they drugged them uh, before the government. And what happened here? It says, And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name, talking about the name of Yeshua, Jesus Christ. Yet here you have uh, filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. He says, what does Peter say? Does Peter say, oh, okay, uh, you know what? We're supposed to obey the authorities, so we're just going to go ahead and bow the knee, and we won't preach Jesus no more? Is that what he said? Or did he say something entirely different? Let's read Acts 5.29. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. We must obey God rather than men. Okay? Now, a, a great example of this uh, would be abortion, especially in the United States of America. We know that m abortion is murder. You cannot use steel tongs to reach into the womb of a mother, grab the child by its head, tear it to pieces, drag it out of the womb of its mother, cut it up into pieces, and sell those organs and those body parts to the highest bidder on the market. That, my friends, is exactly what the Israelites did when they threw their children in the fire to ball. So, is it uh, that we should bow down to allowing our tax money to be spent to murder children and to sell their organs and their body parts on the market to the highest bidder? No, my friends, it's not. It's not. Should we bow the knee to such a law? No, we should not. And this is just a perfect example of a modern, something modern day that is going on. Again, if it is outside of the laws of God, Christians must stand for what is right according to the word of God and not bow down to any man who teaches or preaches anything outside the word of God, no matter, no matter whether it is a law of man or not. And Christians need to wake up. They need to wake up and they need to realize these things. Uh, in fact, if you are a Christian and you live in the United States and you understand that millions of children have been murdered in the wombs of their mothers with our tax money, I would encourage you to go to your prayer closet and to pray and to repent for these things and tell God, Yahweh God the Father, I promise I will stand against this. I know they are taking my money to pay uh, for this, but I wash my hands of this. I do not stand for this. I do not condone this, nor will I condone it in my spirit and nor will I condone it in my flesh. And I will use the power of the vote and any means necessary that I can to peaceably stop this. And then, my friends, you need to get out and get the word out that you do not understand you do not stand or nor do you condone these things and that these things are indeed 
against the Word of God. See, that's, that's what Christians do, my friends. And a lot of folks don't understand that, and they don't know that, and a lot of these 501c3 uh, preachers and teachers uh, in these uh, modern-day churchianity uh, churches today are telling people to go hide under your bed, you see, because they can't tell you to do anything different, because they've incorporated themselves into the government, you see, and they're not allowed to say these kinds of things. They're not allowed to preach the Word of God any longer because they have incorporated themselves with the government and they are not allowed to say these things or they will lose their tax-exempt status. Oh, how terrible would that be? How is that compared to losing your soul in the pit and your children and your children's children? And not only your children and your children's children, but your whole flock and everyone else that you have led down the road into that pit because you have failed to teach and preach the truth. Something that we need to, to think about as Christians today. Again, we must obey God rather than men. Let's take a look at Daniel 3.12 very quickly. I have that uh, bookmarked here. I want to take us over there to that as well. This is uh, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. And I just want to read this. You remember Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, who were thrown in the fiery furnace for not bowing down to the king's false god. Remember that? Let's just read a little bit of that here. He says, uh, Daniel 3.12 says this, There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the providence of Babylon, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into the burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so... Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. And we all know the rest of the story. The king had them bound, and he wanted the fire seven times hotter than it normally was. And actually men died, the story tells us, that his own people, his men, his soldiers died trying to get the fire hot enough to suit the king. That's how enraged Nebuchadnezzar was with Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. He bound them and he threw them into the fire. And as Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego said, they said very clearly, listen to what they say in the last two lines. He said, if it be so, he says, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. He says, but even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. So they, they were ready for God to either save them or not save them. Either way, they were not going to bow down to the king. This, my friends, is a Christian. This is a follower of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ the Messiah, who was the Word made in the flesh, who came down to walk among and to preach among men. This, my friends, is a Christian. This is a true Christian. We need to know and understand the first half of the book as well as the last half of the book. How important is it for us to know and understand these things? Let's take a look at uh, also Romans 12:8. I think I have that uh, under my next bookmark here. Yep, 12.8. What does uh, Paul tell us in the book of Romans in the 12th chapter? And I just want to read this in the blue. I'll hide this for you. He says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, he says, live peaceably with all. Do we hear that? If possible. Is it always possible? No, my friends, it's not always possible. 
Because there are always going to be evil men out there trying to get us to murder our children and do all kinds of iniquity that is against the laws of God. And as Christians, we cannot, we cannot, if possible, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all, if possible. Important for us to know and to understand, my friends. Let's take a look at uh, 2 Corinthians 5.20. Uh, I think I have that bookmarked here for us, ready to go. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God, making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. We are ambassadors for Christ. That does not mean to run and hide under your bed. That does not mean when it comes time to put your shoes on and your jacket and to go vote that you just say, oh, I'm not of this world, so I don't have to. It is important for God's people to protect their brothers and sisters, my friends. And if going out in voting, by voting for someone who stands for religious... Uh, 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 the, uh, what am I... I lost my words here. To, to be able to worship God, the God of your choice, okay, that is the law of the land, as our Constitution states. If that man is going to support that, okay, now, it's not up to, our, to us as Christians to support all these other religions by no means. But if it means uh, protecting our people so that we can uh, worship the way we want to, we need to vote that way. We need to vote that way so that our brothers and sisters are not hauled into jail for preaching and teaching the word of Yahweh God the Father. Okay? So we need to vote. Sometimes you have to vote for the lesser of the two evils. If it protects God's people, if a man believes that abortion is wrong and you can stop the murdering of millions of children by your vote, you need to put your shoes on, get up off the couch, stop hiding under your bed and praying, and put your hands to the plow and go vote. This is expected of you, and this is exactly what Paul's talking about in the 13th chapter of Romans. Okay, obey the laws of man as long as they don't d d disobey the laws of God. We as Christians have a responsibility to do what we can do. And if we can stop war by voting, do you not think that Yeshua HaMashiach would have us vote? I think so. If you do not vote, then you will need to pick up your guns very soon. And that's what it's coming to in this world. Because people are slothful. Christians are being lied to. 501c3 churches cannot talk about uh, politics or, or, or uh, who is running and who's not running and what they believe in. They're not allowed. They belong, they're incorporated with the government. That's why they don't. My friends, this is not of God. This is not of God. And we need to know and understand it's not of God. At least here in the United States, we have the been given the right to vote and to protect God's people. By that vote, we can protect God's people through religious liberty. And I'm not saying that God's people should stand up for all kinds of other religions. But it do, if it protects God's people, then we must do it. If it protects children from dying, then we must vote. If it protects our children from having one bathroom to use with pedophiles and, and women and children all going to use your little girl's same girl, little girl's bathroom, then you need to vote. And that's what Paul is saying here. Okay? We are not of this world, we, but we are in this world. And why we are in this world, we need to live peaceably as long as it is up to us and as long as it with, is within our power to live peaceably. If you do not vote, Peace will be taken from you. If you sit and do nothing, you will pay the price. We need to know these things and understand these things and stop letting our pastors, preachers, and bishops, uh, who are modern-day Sadducees and Pharisees, tell us any different or let these things go unsaid in the churches of God. So, once again, uh, Paul tells us very clearly, and, and if you look at these words that are written in red, I want you to... Just, just uh, think of think of Hitler. Is Hitler someone who was a ruler who was not a terror to good conduct? Does that match Hitler's definition of who he was? Do you think? Was he God's servant? 
Do you think he was the our God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's servant? Or do you think he was the God of this world's servant? Which servant do you think he was? Again, who carries out God's wrath? Was he carrying out God's wrath when he murdered and 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 did scientific tests on the bodies of, of these of the Jewish people? Think about it. They are ministers of God, says Paul, also written in the red here. So was Hitler a minister of God, do you think? Now, many people will say, yeah, 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 because God hates the Jews. Well, those people do not understand the word of God uh, by any stretch of the imagination, and they need to go back to Bible school 101 and read the first half of the book to know and, who, uh, to know and understand who they're talking about. This, once again, my friends, is a wrong teaching. So we need to know and we need to understand that we are to obey the things of man and obey man's laws as long as it does not conflict with the law of Yahweh God the Father. Okay, so let's continue on. Romans uh, 13, 8 says, also says something very, uh, very interesting. He says, Oh, no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love the, the, your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. So many people will say, well, see you there, pastor, all you got to do is love one another, and if you just love one another, you're going to fulfill all the law. Well, it doesn't say here that you're going to fulfill all the law by doing this. It says that you are fulfilling the law, of course, that, that part of the law that says that, okay? And in most of the law, that indeed is fulfilling the law. But what is the greatest commandment? Let me ask you that. When the apostles asked the, the Messiah, Yeshua Mashiach, what is the greatest commandment? He says what? He said to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, all of your strength. He says, he who loves mother or father more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Did he not? So we are to love God first and above all things and above all people and then love our brothers as ourselves. Now, that's not mentioned here, is it? No. So, what Paul is saying here is love, love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. You are fulfilling the law by loving your brother. But there's more to the law than just that. Paul is not saying that this is just all there is to the law. So, I want us to understand that. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is fulfilling the law. And love is loving your brother is fulfilling the law. But the law also says many other things. And it says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength. And if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength, you will obey the laws of God that have been written in your heart and in your mind through what his son did at the cross by nailing the penalty of the law to the cross. Okay, so very good. Let's continue on. And we're going to move on to Romans 13, 11. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake up from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. Okay. Now, one, one thing I want, to, I want to back up here just very quickly here to is uh, Romans 13.10, because I get this all the time, and I think I have this bookmarked. Um, if I can find it here, yes. Uh, let's move to um, Matthew 3.13, E9. I just want to talk about that word fulfill. Many uh, Sadducees and Pharisees today will tell you that the word fulfilled or fulfilling means to do or to come to an end or do an end or do away with. Well, I want to read you something uh, and on how they use the word fulfilled. The word fulfilled is the word pleru. Okay? Now, listen to how they use the word pleru in Matthew 3.13. And I have that bookmarked for us as well. Okay, here it is. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John, John the Baptist, to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so, 
For thus it is fitting for us to fulfill pluru all righteousness. Then he consented. So, if fulfill means done away with, then that means that all righteousness is done away with. Does that sound plausible? And this is just one, one uh, example of how the word fulfill is used in the Bible. It means we, we need to do this as an example for others. Now, what does uh, Yeshua HaMashiach say in Matthew 5.17? And I don't have that bookmarked. I'm just going to take you over to it. Matthew 5.17, or Matthew, I'm sorry, yes, Matthew 5.17 he says, I didn't come, don't think I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to pluru them, to fulfill them. So does that mean do away with? No, it does not. I came to do them, to set an example for you to do them. I, I came to do them in their entirety, to complete them. And you are supposed to pick up your cross and follow me. He says, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, not the crossing of a T, not the dotting of an I will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Heaven and earth will pass away, he says, before the, uh, before the law will pass away. He says, I did not come to abolish them. I came to fulfill them. And what did we just see uh, in Matthew 17? Where uh, he, or no, I'm sorry, not Matthew 17, but... Uh, the last scripture that we just went to, what did we just look at that? That was uh, Matthew 3.13, uh, E9. I had that I had that bookmarked in my wrong uh, thing here. Here it is, where he says, Let it be so for now, this it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. They needed to do all righteousness. That's what they were doing. Fulfill means to do, to fill up, to do all righteousness. Then he consented. Our Messiah came to do the law as an example for us to also do the law. Okay? All right. So, and again, if you have not if you have not been with us through this whole teaching of the book of Romans from the beginning, you really need to start at the beginning. Uh, I know a lot of people that are coming in in the middle of this are going to be a little bit confused by uh, some of the things uh, that they are seeing. But uh, again, we already know the proclamations of Paul himself. We just read them. Paul says, do we abolish the law by our faith? Absolutely not. On the contrary, we uphold the law. I mean, he just can't say it any more clearly than that. So that is, I just wanted to go back to that for the folks that have been taught that fulfill always means to do away with or done away with so they don't have to be bothered with it. That's not the, what it means. That is not the correct uh, meaning of that every single solitary time. Okay, so let's now let's move on to Romans 13, 11. Let's continue. He says, besides this, you know the time, that the hour has come for you to wake up from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day at hand. So then let us cast off the works of, the darkness, of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not quarreling and jealousy. My friends, these are all things from the law, all things that we are commanded not to do, that he's quoting from. Let's continue. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Now, why does he say that? Make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. One more time, I just want to take us take a look at, uh, at these not the, not the laws, but the proclamations of Paul. Wait, what did he say here? He said, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. Why is it hostile? For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That's exactly what he's talking about here in the uh, this book of Romans, in the very last sentence. He says very clearly... At the very bottom here, Romans 13, 14, he says, Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Why? Because the flesh cannot please God. Why can't it please God? Because it does not submit to God's law according to the Apostle Paul. Okay? So let's be clear about that. Let's be clear about that. I want you to be so clear about this that you can teach these things for yourself. 
we've got to teach these things. We've got to know them well enough that we can teach them and pass them on to our children and our children's children and to change the course of where Christianity, today's modern-day Christianity, is headed. Uh, and uh, it's, it's extremely important for us to know and to understand what the writings of Paul really mean and what he was really teaching and what he was really preaching. And again, as Peter says in, uh, in 2 Peter 3.16, the writings of Paul are hard to understand. And the ignorant, who are ignorant, who don't read the Bible for themselves, and the unstable will twist the writings of Paul to their own destruction. Be careful not to be led away by lawless people and lose your own stability, says Peter in 2 Peter 3.16. All right, very good. So we know in the 13th chapter of Romans that, uh, that Paul was not saying that we need to completely bow the knee to our governments all the time. We are to bow to them as long as they don't obstruct the laws of God. Now, I want to say this to you, and I want, to just, uh, I want you to think about this for just a moment. When we are talking about the laws of God, there are 613 mitzvot, or laws of God, found in the Torah, in the Tanakh. Okay, 613. I want to ask you, I want to ask you, do you know how many laws, just if in the United States, now depending on whatever country you live in, you may live in Australia, or you may live in China, or J J Japan, or Mexico, wherever you live, how many laws are in your land? How many laws? Well, I know in the United States, we cannot count the number of laws. Nobody has that answer. Nobody could possibly count the laws. It is infinite. We have an infinite amount of laws that man has written, okay, to, to, uh, to be uh, subjugated to those who write the laws. Okay? So, how much easier would it be just to keep God's laws? There are 613 laws. And we need to study those laws to understand what those laws are. Most of those laws today we can't do because in order to keep the laws, we need a temple, which we do not have. We need the court system that Yahweh God the Father put on earth, which was the Levitical priesthood. And Aaron, who was the high priest, you had to be a descendant of Aaron to be a high priest. We don't have those on the earth uh, anymore today. But we do know that those laws will be reinstituted during his millennial reign. When he comes back, he will reinstitute those things. We know that. We know that God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So we know that God does not change. Man changes. God does not. He does not change hats and morph and evolve and do all of these things as man does. So we need to keep these things in the proper perspective, and we need to know these things, and we need to take these things to our prayer closet and to think on these things. So uh, we can know and understand. I think that puts the 13th chapter of Romans in the proper perspective. Uh, and again, you can rewind the video and, and go back and look at a lot of these different scriptures for yourselves, and you find many other scriptures that will coincide with what we are saying. Again, take these things to your prayer closet and ask if they be true or not. Moving on to the 14th chapter of Romans, I want to, before we even get started on this 14th chapter, I have highlighted in blue, let me go to uh, the screen here, I have highlighted in blue what I want you to look at, because this is what this chapter is all about. Now, we have people that come to us repeatedly with their candy stick scripture of Romans 14 5 telling us that it doesn't matter which day the Sabbath is and that they can keep the Sabbath whatever day they want to keep it because of Romans 14 5 okay we hear it all the time people who continuously quote from Romans 14 don't know diddly squat about what Romans 14 is all about now I have highlighted some things that Romans 14 is about in blue and I want you to notice how many times the word eat, eat, is in this chapter. Look at this, look at this chapter. He may eat anything, eats only vegetables. Who eats, who eats, who eats and eats again. And as we scroll down, what do we see? By what you eat, eating and drinking, for the sake of food, eat meat or drink wine, if he eats, because the eating Okay, 
I just wanted you to see that this chapter of Romans is about food, fasting, and eating. It does not give us license to just choose whatever day we want to, to serve him or to keep his holy seventh-day sanctified Sabbath that he said would be a sign between him and his people, a perpetual agreement for all generations. Okay? So as we move through this, and I wanted to just bring this to your attention right off the bat, this chapter is about food and eating and fasting. That's what this chapter is about. So let's get into it. Romans 14.1 As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but do not quarrel over opinions about food and eating, because that's what this is about. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Stop right there. Stop right there. Before we go any further, let me explain to you what Paul is talking about right here, because his audience knows what he's talking about, but if we haven't read the Bible, we really don't know what he's talking about. In order to know and understand what he's talking about, we need to go over to 1 Corinthians 8.1. Now listen to this. He says, one person believes he made anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. What's he talking about? Let's go over here very quickly. I want to go to uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 8.1. And let's read this. This will explain this. We must keep this in the proper context. He says this. He says, Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore... As to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence, and that there is no God but one, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the only one God. Okay, For although there may be so-called gods in, in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is, there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. So what's he, what's he saying here? What's Paul saying? He's saying very clearly that some of the brothers were afraid to eat meat that was sacrificed to idols. Okay? But we don't have to worry about eating food that was sacrificed to idols because those idols don't even exist. If, if we don't eat food that is sacrificed to idols, then we're giving credence. We're saying, well, maybe those gods do exist. So what Paul is saying is here, we already know these, these, these gods, these idols that they have, they, they are nothing. They are nothing. They are totem poles and, and the sun and the moon and the stars and the earth. They worship everything that crawls. Uh, back in that day, they worshipped everything. Everything was a god. Every statue that they they put together gods and built gods, golden calves for Pete's sake, and then they worshipped them because they, they, they thought they were mediators to well, this god or that god. Okay, so what Paul is saying is here is he say we know that an idol has no real existence and that there there is only one god. He says okay. So let's continue on. He says, however, not all possess this knowledge. Okay, so some of them were just coming out of that, and they still believed, they, they believed their family may have believed in the, this totem pole that they were worshiping. They might have believed in that totem pole for generations. These are greenhorns that don't know the law. They haven't sit in the synagogues and read the laws of Moses. They don't know anything about the laws. They're just green. They're brand new. They're coming to the faith brand new. So they are still afraid of, kind of afraid of those gods. And they, and they don't want anything to do with those gods because they understand that our God says that he's extremely upset with anybody who worships those gods. So they don't even want to eat meat that's sacrificed to them. They're afraid. They don't want to do that. Okay? So that's what Paul is saying. He, he says, however, not all possess this knowledge that those gods really don't exist. He says, but some, through former association with idols, hear this now, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defile because they are they are weak in the faith okay so this is what he's talking about uh in uh this first verse of 14th what is what is he talking about romans 14 2 
the person believes that he may eat anything, one person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. This is what he's talking about. Okay, this is, this is why the person that's eating vegetables, this is why he's weak, because he's afraid to eat the meat because it was sacrificed to an idol. That doesn't exist. But he doesn't know that because he's been wrapped up with these idols for so long, he doesn't want to eat the meat, okay, because he doesn't want to be defiled by that, okay? Listen, to, let's continue on. He says, food will not commend us, uh, commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed because you're eating this food that was used to sacrifice to his old idol. Okay, so you could destroy a brother's faith by doing this is what he's saying, even though it's okay. He's, t he's saying you could destroy a brother who's young in the faith. You could destroy his faith by doing this. He says, don't do that. Don't eat the meat in front of them, and don't, don't let them catch you doing that. If he eats that way and he doesn't want to eat uh, food that was sacrificed to that idol, then support him as he's growing, is what Paul is saying. Thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience, this it, it, uh, when it is weak, you sin against Christ by doing this. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat lest I make my brother stumble, even though it's okay to eat the meat, okay? And again, I want us to, to uh, be very careful with this, what we're reading here. I want us to know and understand what, what, what are we reading here so that we don't get this all backwards, okay? So now you know what Paul is talking about when he says one person believes he may eat anything. And by the way, it doesn't mean anything when, when, when Paul says anything, is he talking about unclean, unclean food? No, he's not. He's not talking about it's okay to eat unclean food. Many people will say, well, there it is. See, Paul says, believe you may eat anything, right? Well, let me ask you, my friends. I have a, a plastic bottle. Can I, can I eat this plastic bottle? Can I eat this? No. I have a dog. I have a dog. Can I eat my dog? Can I eat my cat? No. No, they're not even food. They're not considered they're not even considered food. And people who study their Bible know that pigs are not food, crustacean is not food, crabs are not food, lobster is not food, shellfish are not food. Okay, it's not on it's not even food. It's not food. Because why? Because God says that's not food. What is food? This is clean these are the clean animals. Anything with a split hoof that eats the cud, okay? These are these are clean animals, okay? These are not these not these are not even food. So when he says when a person believes he may eat anything, he's talking about about meat that God said was food that was sacrificed to these other fake gods. That's what he's talking about. It's okay to eat anything that God calls food, not anything that he has said is unclean. That's not even considered food. It's like eating a plastic bottle in the eyes of God. That, that's not even on your on your menu as far as food is concerned. People, people who keep the things of God and understand the laws of God, we don't eat uh, pigs and we don't eat crustaceans and we don't eat the things that are vacuum cleaners of the earth. They are made to keep the toxins uh, out of the earth. That's what they're there for. And scientifically, we know that these certain animals that God tells us not to eat are full of things that cause toxins and cancers and, and thing, legions to grow on our body and all kinds of things to happen to us. Okay. So we know and we can understand when he says, when Paul says one person believes he may eat anything, that's anything that God says you can eat, you can eat, okay? Not what he says you can't eat, okay? So let's be clear and let's use our, our thinking caps here while we're going here. While the weak person only eats vegetables. Uh, he says this, he says, let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. For God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on a servant of another? Is it before his own master that he stands or falls? And he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Now, here comes the passage. Everybody seems to think they just pull this passage out, Romans 14, 15, and they say, well, this has to do with the Sabbath, and this says, this is why I can keep the Sabbath. Clearly, Paul is talking about fasting here in the next sentence. Let's read it. 
One person esteems one day better than another, while another esteem, esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Okay? Now, if you just read that and you take that as a candy stick scripture out of the Bible, and you wave that around and you keep saying, one person esteems one day more than another, while another esteems all days alike, each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Well, I'm fully convinced that Sunday is the Sabbath, so that's the Sabbath I'm keeping, like it or not. Well, that's fine as long as you understand that you are taking Scripture out of context and you are telling a lie. That is a lie. That's not even what this Scripture has to say. Okay? And let's just think about it there for a minute. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. So if I'm convinced that uh, raping women is okay, I can just go out and rape women. I'm fully convinced. It's okay, right? Does that make any sense? I think it's, I'm convinced in my mind that stealing is a good thing to do and I'm not going to be held accountable for it. So, I'm just going to go out and steal. Does that make any sense? I mean, pick your own law. Pick your own law. And that's what Christians like to do. They like to pick their own sin, their own law that they don't like to follow, and they'll use this to try and combat you and to push you away and say, See, as long as I'm convinced in my own mind. We can certainly know that's not even the context that this was taken. And let's read the whole thing here, the, next, the two scriptures together. One person esteems one day better than the other, while another esteems all days alike. Talking about days that they fast. The Pharisees and the scribes historically believed that you had to fast, all like they would have a Wednesday, or they would say you have to fast on Friday. And other people would say, no, I got, I, you got to fast on Monday and Wednesday. And blah, 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 blah. In the Bible, in the Torah, there is no day commanded to fast other than the days that God commands on his feast days to fast. Okay? So th th this is all just man-made hooey is what it is. And this is what Paul is speaking against. He's speaking against people that are arguing on which day to fast. He says, one person esteems one day better than another, while other es uh, another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. Do you see anything in here about doing as you please concerning the Sabbath day of God? Absolutely not. You see, if we read the whole chapter, at least if we read the chapter that the scripture is in, we would not be so foolish as to think that this has anything to do with doing as you please on God's holy, sanctified Sabbath day. Uh, but this is people will use this over and against you all the time. Know how to fight back with this. Know how to just smile at them and shake your head and say, you know what? This is all about food, eating, and fasting. That's what Romans 14 is all about. It's not about doing as you please. So be sure to know these things and be ready to have a response uh, for these things when people tell you these things. They always like to use their candy stick scripture, whether they know what it means or not. And we as Christians must be very careful, as we said this past Seventh-day Sabbath on our Seventh-day Sabbath live program. Be careful not to do this. Keep these scriptures in context. Let's continue. Romans 14, 7. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Okay, now I want us to know these things. I want us to understand these things. And it's so important to keep these things in the proper context. Now, Let's continue reading here. Uh, Romans 14, 11, He says, For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us will give an account to himself to God. Therefore, let us not, not pass judgment on, on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way 
of your brother. So we need to be very careful in those who we are bringing up into the faith. You know, we sometimes we're we're almost too harsh, you know, with with people who are who are trying to come to the faith and to learn the faith. And this is one of the problems that uh, that Paul had with the circumcision group that they were trying to tell these new converts, you got to be circumcised right now, right now, or you're not saved. You're not saved. And Paul says, no, you're putting the horse before the cart. They must first have faith in the Messiah so that the laws of God can be written in their hearts and in their minds. Then they will be moved to be circumcised. It's the exact same thing as baptism. I can't force you to be baptized. If I force you to be baptized against your will and you don't have faith that moves you to be baptized, then your baptism is of no effect. And that's what Paul was telling them. And again, for those of you who I've just lost right now, uh, you can see, uh, go to holyimpactministries.com, visit our HIM video studies, and uh, check out our video out uh, on whether or not Paul preached against circumcision. He certainly did not preach against circumcision. And anyone who reads their Bible knows and understands this, and it can be proven very easily. In fact, as soon as we get done with the book of Romans, we'll be moving into the book of Acts uh, and uh, we're going to look at that uh, big debate that went on in Acts 15, and we're going to put throw that uh, to the ground that Paul ever preached against circumcision. He never preached against, against circumcision, and we know that, those of us who study, to show ourselves approved. But at any rate, this is exactly what he's talking about. You know, we can't, we got to be careful as we bring these people up. Let them have the time to grow, show them the scriptures, share with them, and don't be too overly aggressive uh, with them. Uh, and, and you you want to kind of take them by the hand and lead them through the scriptures, like what we're doing here today, so that they can know and understand what the truth is. And then through faith and through prayer and asking Yahweh God for the discernment, he'll give them the discernment to understand these things. And as the Bible is read to them, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, they will get it if, if they take these things to their prayer closet and ask Yahweh God for the discernment to understand it. Many times we try to understand it on our own and we can't because the writings of Paul are hard to understand. And the unstable and the ignorant, if we're unstable a little bit or if we're ignorant, we don't know these things, we're going to twist the writings of God uh, of Paul to our, to, uh, to our own destruction. And then we're going, to, we're going to twist them to other people's destruction and to our children's destruction. We don't want to do that. We want to make sure that we're praying, asking Yahweh God, God Yahweh, is this the truth? Give this discernment to me. Please show me, help me understand these things, help me in my studies to know what is the truth. And he will give it to you. He will give it to you. He wants you to just ask him, just ask him. He's just waiting for you to turn to him and ask him. Don't trust me as a man or any other man out there. Ask him, is this the truth or is this not the truth? And you will be given the discernment. You will know. He wants to give it to you. So ask for it. You know, there's a passage in the Bible that says, you do not receive because you do not ask. And when you do ask, you ask with wrong intentions. So let's ask with the right intentions. And let's ask. Okay, very good. Many times we just want to study and we want to put it in our own thinking that we're going to be able to understand this on our own. And a lot of times you just cannot. You've got to pray for the discernment. And when he gives you the discernment, you look back and you think, how did I not understand that? That's simple to understand. How did I not get that? How did I not catch that? Paul says, do we nullify the law by our faith? Absolutely not. On the contrary, we uphold the law. I should have known better than that. Uh, but it, you need to ask for the discernment. I can't tell you how many times I read over that time and time and time again and never caught it. Never caught it because I was so taught so entrained to think that God's laws were just all nailed to the cross. I was once saved, always saved. I came down, I said the prayer with the pastor in front of everybody and confessed with my tongue, and that was it. That's all I had to do. And I was saved forever, and once saved, always saved. Once you're saved, you're always saved. That's what they tell you, right? So, and this is how, you, this is how it works. And this is how our adversary deceives even the very elect, if it were possible, if it were possible. Okay. So again, if eating something, I have a brother, brother Stephen Ben Danoon, who has a YouTube channel. You may have heard of him. He is a rabbi. He's a brother of mine. I love him. I uh, love his teachings. I've never gotten a chance to actually meet him, uh, but I, I've watched his teachings. Now, he believes not to eat meat. He's a vegetarian, and he won't eat meat. So if I was to go to my brother's house, brother Stephen Ben Danoon, 
and he was to have vegetables on the table and he didn't have anything else, do you think that I would sit there and say, where's the beef? <laughs> no, I absolutely would not. Because that would be putting a stumbling block in front of my brother, right? And if he came to my house and I had meat there, I would be willing to bet you he knows his Bible well enough that he would probably, he would probably eat the meat. He would probably, because he would, would want, not want to offend me or to hurt my faith. Okay, so we got to kind of be careful. He believes in his mind from what he's read in the Bible that he can't eat meat. Now, I don't hold to that, that teaching and that preaching. I've heard it. I've listened to it. I've paid attention to it. Uh, but I do not hold to that. And uh, that's something that we just disagree on as brothers. But I, I love him still the same, and I know that he's a brother. Uh, I understand why he might believe that through the scriptures, and he has scriptures that would tend to seem to say that. Uh, so what happens is one of the two of us needs to grow in our faith. Yeah, which one? God will God will let us know. But uh, I, I'm not going to do anything to hinder him, and I know he would not do anything to, to hinder my faith either. So again, this is a little bit about what we're talking about. It can be confusing. So let's continue on uh, here, Romans 14, 14. I know and I am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. Again, nothing is unclean that God said is is unclean. Unclean animals are still unclean, okay? Nothing is in, unclean in itself. So he's talking about animals that were sacrificed to totem poles. That's what he's talking about here, he says. So none of nothing, none of that is, is unclean in itself. But it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. So if this guy has been worshiping these idols and, and slaughtering this cattle to that, to that idol, and because of that, because he's been wrapped up in that, he doesn't want to eat that meat, he feels it defiles him, then leave him alone. Respect that. Respect that. He's trying to honor Yahweh God the Father. Okay? Even though Paul says his faith is weak. Uh, his faith will grow if you allow it. Don't destroy it, is what he's saying. Okay, Romans 14, 15. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one from whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good to be spoken of as evil. Okay? Don't let what you regard as good to be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. Now, how do you serve Christ? What did Christ say? What did, you, what did Messiah say? He said, if you love me, what? Keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my What commandments are that? Who is Jesus Christ according to 1 John? He is the Word. Where do we find the Word at? In the beginning of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, the Word was with God, and the God was Word, and they, He hovered over the waters of the darkness. The Word was with God from the very beginning. Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, was the Word made flesh that came down to preach among men. What are His commandments? All of the Torah and the Tanakh are His commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. I did not come to abolish the law or the prophets until not a crossing of a T or the dotting of an I will pass away from the law until heaven and earth pass away. We do not nullify the law by our faith. By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Starting to get the picture here? We're starting to put it together here? I know many of you, the lights are coming on and you're like, whoa, I've never heard this before. It comes from reading and studying. We must know and understand that the writings of Paul, just like Peter said, are hard to understand. The ignorant and the unstable will twist them to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. And boy, I tell you what, this has been going on for the better part of 2,000 years. So let's continue. He says, uh, let's go to uh, Romans 14.18. Uh, Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Do not forsake food, for the sake of food, I'm sorry, do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean. Now, this is another scripture where people will say, see, everything's clean, everything's clean. Again, this bottle is not clean. My dog and the cat and my parakeet's not clean. They're not clean, okay? Everything that God said was food is clean. Like, I can't eat my desk. I can't eat 
can't eat my pen. That's that's not what he's talking about when he says that everything is indeed clean. Again, Scripture taken out of context. If we read our Bible and we know and understand what the Word of God says, we know what he means by everything. He's talking about including these animals that were sacrificed to these to this, tel- this totem pole or whatever this guy's been sacrificing it to. Okay? So everything is indeed clean means what God says, what God gave us as food, everything is clean. Don't let them, just because they sacrificed it to another God, that doesn't mean it's not clean. Okay, everything is clean, it is clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. Is it not good to eat meat or drink wine? Or I'm sorry, it is not good to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. If a man comes over to my house and he doesn't drink, or if he's an alcoholic, uh, are you going to drink in front of him? Are you going to pour wine at the table in front of an alcoholic? No, you're putting a stumbling block in front of your brother. Don't do it. Don't do it. Is there anything wrong with drinking wine? No, there is not. And we can look at that through the Word of God as well. Again, something that we have to be very careful about, and we have to study to know what Yahweh God the Father says and does not say about alcohol. That's another study for another time. Uh, But we, again, it's just something I just use that as an example. You're not going to bring alcohol out in front of an alcoholic because you're putting a stumbling block in front of him. He's going to get drunk. He's going to hurt himself and his family and his job. And and you're going to, it's going to be on your hands because you did it. So don't do it. Just don't do it. Okay, it says Romans 14, 22. It says, the faith that you keep, have uh, kept between yourself and God, it says, blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. So, Uh, Here's an example of what he's saying in Romans 14, 23. Say the Sabbath day, and you want to go to the store and buy a pack of gum, okay? But you know it's the Sabbath, and you're thinking, that's the day I'm supposed to rest. Can I get in my car? I'm going to be sitting down. Can I turn the ignition, and can I drive to the store, and can I purchase a pack of gum without breaking the Sabbath? I'm not sure. Then don't do it. Then don't do it. If you're not sure, then don't do it. It's better to err on the side uh, of safety. Because what what does it say? What does Paul tell us right here, right now? He says it's because if it's not of faith, he says you're going to be condemned for it. For whatever does not proceed from faith, you've got to be sure you're doing the right. And you have scripture to back it up. And you know the word of God, and you've prayed for the discernment that it's okay, then then you're you're going to be safe. It's going to be all right, okay? But if you have doubts about doing something, many people right now, and, and hear me, you people that are keeping the first day of the week Sabbath, many of you people in your heart, you have a doubt in your heart about whether or not you should be keeping that day. God has put that doubt in your heart. It is not his seventh-day Sabbath. It is the Roman Catholic seventh-day Sabbath, and the world knows it. It's in all your history books. All you got to do is Google it to know the answer, You need to come out of that because you are in danger. The day that you are keeping the Sabbath is not of faith. You know better than that. And this is exactly what I'm talking about. Come back to the seventh-day Sabbath. Do as God says. It is a sign between him and his people, a perpetual agreement for all generations. These are things we need to think about. We need to comprehend these things. It's not just about food. It's about everything that we do. We need to be sure that what we're doing is the right thing. And if we have a little bit of guilt or a little bit of a problem knowing whether it's right or whether it's wrong, we need to dig into the Bible. We need to make sure that we know. We need to pray for the discernment, take it to our prayer closet until we fully know and understand what is the truth and let him give us the truth. And then when we know it, then we can do it or we can abstain from it. If he says, if if he shows us very clearly that it's wrong, then it's wrong. Stay away from it. Stay away from it. You know it's wrong. Just stay away from it. It's not that hard not that hard. Again, how many laws does man have? Trillions of laws. We Just tax code alone is, is, a, is a book that thick, and that might be generous to say it's ethics. Probably more like that thick. But the tax code laws alone that we, ha- we are under, let alone all of the different kind of laws that we have for businesses and for schools and for children and what they can wear and what they can't wear and where you can cross across the street and where you can't and, and all of these different kinds of things. 
Uh, I mean, there's laws upon, upon laws upon laws. It's much easier just to keep God's laws. Let's just keep God's laws. And if we're here on earth, we should keep the laws of man again, uh, as long as they do not go against the laws of God. It's just that simple. So, uh, I hope that this teaching has been a blessing to you. I hope we've opened the eyes and the hearts of people. I hope we've put some questions in your heart that you might go back over these scriptures Play this video back and forth again. Tear it apart. Put it back together again. Read your scripture and, and know and understand how to reconcile these scriptures that Paul is speaking about. We know that Paul oftentimes is, says things like, anyone who is under the law is under a curse. That seems to make it seem like God's laws are a curse and they're bondage. But then he turns around in Romans 3.31 and he says, Do we nullify the law by our faith? Absolutely not. On the contrary, we uphold the law. It's not just the hearers of the law who will be sanctified, justified by God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. So it almost sounds as though Paul is speaking out of both sides of his mouth, or he's schizophrenic. He's teaching two different doctrines, and that's what many atheists believe. They read the Bible. They don't understand it. They throw it down in the desk and say it's full of controversy, and, and then it doesn't even make any sense, and they just walk away. And they walk away because they don't have the discernment given by Yahweh God to understand what they're reading. They are forever reading and never understanding. This is what happens, my friend. Or, as Peter says, that because they are unstable and they are ignorant of these things, they twist the laws of God to their own destruction. And they try to twist it and say that it says something that it does not say. Neither one of those things are in neither one of those places are a place where we want to be. We want to be in the truth. God says very clearly, I am a spirit, and I am to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. We must worship him in spirit and in truth, and nothing less. And that means studying to show ourselves approved as we are commanded. And to remember that he is our ultimate instructor. And in the book of Ephesians, Paul tells us very clearly, he gives pastors, he gives teachers, he gives those people for the building up of the body, for the understanding, so we can come to spiritual maturity. But our ultimate teacher is not a man on earth. It is him. As a pastor, it's my job to lead you to him, not to lead you to me, or to anyone else, or some denominational understanding, or some charter of men. No, no, no. If you have a denomination stamped on your forehead, get rid of it. Wash it off right now. Get rid of it. Walk away from it. Don't have anything to do with it. We are not denominations. We are holy priests of Yahweh God the Father. That's who we are. We are sons and daughters of God. That's who we are. We have been grafted into the olive tree. And if you don't know who that is, then you need to take a look at uh, Romans chapter 11. We just did that a couple weeks ago, and it'll help you understand. Again, we have videos on all of these things at holyimpactministries.com. You can uh, go there and take a look at some of the videos. Some of them are older. We're trying to get them uh, updated, and uh, some of them uh, take a long time to get through. Uh, because we, uh, we we did them years ago, but they are good videos and the truth is still there, so you can still watch them and uh, be fed by the truth. And again, we just we ask that you take these things to your prayer closet, pray about these things so that you know whether they be true or not. And that's all that we ask. In the meantime, God bless you. Thank you for spending your time with us here on our Bible study night, Wednesday nights at 8 o'clock, and we are getting down to the last uh, couple chapters of the book of Romans. And we have understood so many things. I think if you have studied this from the very beginning, uh, you know the warnings of uh, the Apostle Peter. You know what Paul actually was teaching and preaching and that he was never teaching and preaching against the laws of God. We'll see that uh, uh, all through the, the Word of God as we study it. Again, I think you're going to find, uh, moving into the book of Acts, that uh, uh, you're going to find a lot of things that, out that you did not know concerning the Apostle Paul. Uh, I want to say this to you. Uh, in between uh, this book of Romans, I'd like you to read the book of James because the book of James tells us very clearly, a little bit more clearly, what Paul is telling us in the book of Romans. Many people will say that the book of James is in conflict with the book of Romans. It is not. It is not. And if you read it, 
and you go through, you take this study, and then you go back and you read the book of James, you will see that exactly what we've been teaching and preaching is exactly the truth. It all lines up very nice and very neatly. One thing that I find interesting, before I let you go, and I'm sorry, I have a habit of doing this, but before I let you go, I just want to say this. For those people who believe that God's laws have been nailed to the cross, once saved, always saved, dispensational grace, all this crap and garbage that, that men preach, that comes from Roman Catholicism. It comes from Catholicism that was put out over about 1,700 years ago. And we've just been fed this, and uh, the Protestant churches of today are following after Catholicism. And they're, it, it's where it came from. That's where this stuff comes from. And with a little bit of homework in church history, you can know this. But those people who believe that laws, God's laws are all nailed to the cross, when you bring them to uh, these things that Paul says very clearly, and uh, like this here, okay, let's just take a look at this very quickly. When you bring them to this, they don't know how to answer these scriptures. They don't know how to reconcile these scriptures with the other scriptures. Because these scriptures clearly tell us that the laws of God are not nailed to the cross somewhere. They're not nailed to a tree somewhere. They're written in our hearts. They're written in our hearts. What? Uh, before I let you go, I just, just to nail that down, for those of you who may be new, what does it say in Hebrews 10, 15? Listen to this now. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us after for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. Now, where is this is Paul preaching in Hebrews in the New Testament. Where is he getting this from? Jeremiah 31, 31 is exactly what he's quoting from. And this is what God says. This is the new covenant that everybody's talking about. I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and write them on their minds. My friends, are God's laws written in your heart? And are they in your mind? Or are they nailed to some tree somewhere? Think about it. Think about it. Just think about it. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds will be no more. Why? Because at that point in time, he was prophesying about Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ coming. No one could figure out how that that could possibly be. Uh, but again, uh, he did it. And we need to know and we need to understand that. 1 John 5, 3. For this is the love of God, and I'll leave you after this. For this is the love of God. See this. Know this. Understand this. Remember this. 1 John 5, 3. This is the biblical definition of the love of God. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. My friends, uh, let me straighten that out. I just want you to make sure you, you see that. There you go. You can read it for yourself. We'll read it again. 1 John 5, 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. I just want to make sure that that's in full screen so that you know and understand that that's what it says. My friends, uh, God bless you. I just want to say thank you again for spending your time with me here. If you're still here, I know that you have a thirst for knowledge. My hope and my prayer is that the grace and the peace of God would be upon you and your family, and that the hand of God would be upon you for his protection over you until we meet again. Don't forget to meet up with us this next Friday night. We are Friday Night Live. We'll have a live event uh, on YouTube, and you can get there by visiting us at holyimpactministries.com. We have a link. Just click that link. It'll take you right to the live event. Uh, Friday night at 9 o'clock we start that. Uh, and we'd be glad to see you there. If not, we will see you next Wednesday night when we move into the 15th uh, chapter of the Book of Romans, moving right along. And uh, we'll give you maybe even a little sneak peek of what's going to happen in the Book of Acts as well. God bless you. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us here. I'm Pastor Scott Blaine with HolyImpactMinistries.com. God bless. And shalom. If you were blessed by this teaching, please consider helping us reach the nations by making a donation today. Thank you, and shalom.